transmission, really that testimony that happened so long ago, did it really happen? Do we really believe it? Are we going to canonize it? Are we going to make it the official written tradition of whatever spiritual tradition we're a part of? So that's kind of how we arrive at the Bible. But you also have to remember that that is only half the story. Think about what, how you got your Bible that's in your hands. Where, where did you get it from? Where? It was a gift. Where did that person get that gift? A store. Where did the store get it? A publisher. Where did the publisher get it? The oh, the author. Who was the author? Oh, now it starts getting a little bit more complicated, doesn't it? Suddenly we have we have to we and we we we've, we've kind of skipped some steps, haven't we? Because how many different variations of the Bible are there? How many different translations? Have you been to the uh, to the Christian store lately? There is. A, I just uh, spent some time buying a. Uh, picking out some Bibles for a friend of mine's kiddos, and at uh, at Mardell over on Hewlin. and I don't know if you've been over there lately, but there's an entire wall on on the back corner that is nothing but hundreds of Bibles in dozens of translations, and that's in the adult side. Then when you go over to the kids side, there are probably just as many in those cool little comic book uh, kiddo Bibles that they love to read. So. We also have to think about the traditions of, of how translation happens, because translation is a part of this. We have to think that each Bible has a different translation. And where did those translations come from? Some guy or woman had to sit down with, a, with something that is considered an authoritative text that was written in one of the original languages, either Greek or Hebrew or Aramaic or some combination thereof, and they had to sit there and translate it. And I don't know, how many of y'all have seen pictures of the Dead Sea Scrolls? Anybody? I know Scott and our lovely, uh, our lovely seminarians over there have. But these, these are like little scraps of parchment. They are like this big. And they've got maybe two words. And those two words could be some spiritual like key to the, to the understanding of the universe. Or it could have been somebody's grocery list. We really, in some cases, don't know. And that's what these translators are there trying to do. They're trying to figure out, what does this really mean? Is this translation something to do with something amazing? Or is it something just mundane that, you know, some guy got mixed up in the in the scrolls. Uh, he was going, he's, his wife was sending him on a honeydew list, and they got mixed up with the, the religious scrolls. We don't know in some cases. So that's kind of how it works. But that is all about how we get our Bible today. That all is, it, it's all in that pot of, of the complicated story about how our Bibles came to our hands today and how those different translations are a part of our life today. So then that brings us to the question about how was the canon actually formed? And there's a lot of different stories about it. Uh, there's a, a lot of misinformation, if I, if I can be so bold as to say so. Um, within the Christian world. A lot of people think that um, this event called the Council of Nicaea got together and they voted on it. And they just said, hey, this is what the Bible is. And from then on, the Council of Nicaea said, this is the canon. Well, that, as I mentioned, is a little bit of a misnomer. The Council of Nicaea didn't do that. We'll talk a little bit about that later. So we, then we have to, if we know that the Council of Nicaea didn't vote on every book of the Bible and say, this Bible is yes, this Bible is, this, this version is no, this is yes, this is no. Well, then how did we get it? And so let's think about that for a moment. The first thing is, who were the, who were the first people with a, a Bible in our tradition? The Jewish people, right? They had their version of the Bible. We call it the, the Hebrew Bible, sometimes the Old Testament, sometimes the First Testament you'll hear it referred to. Um, I try to resist using the Old Testament because I find that um, it's a little pejorative. I mean, imagine if you're a Jewish person and somebody says that your book is the Old Testament. That's why you won't hear me use Old Testament very often. I, I prefer to either use the First Testament or the Hebrew Bible. Um, you'll also hear it referred to as the Tanakh, T-A-N-A-K-H. That is a, that's a fancy um, churchy word. Um, it's the same thing as uh, the the Hebrew Bible, but it is an acronym. It stands for Torah, 
uh, Ketuvim and Nebuhim. Those are the different sections of the, the Bible, uh, the Hebrew Bible. And so you'll sometimes hear it referred to as that. But that's upon what our current Bible was built. Their Bible, the Hebrew Bible, which becomes part of our Bible, was, was finalized um, much sooner than, than, um, than the, the New Testament was, of course, because it was written earlier. So it was finished, uh, uh, a lot of scholars believe, around um, anywhere from 500 to 200 BCE. That's when it kind of gelled and coalesced into the book that uh, the, the Hebrews used. Um, there is a great timeline. I wish I'd had the presence of mind to, um, to make a copy of it for you, but it's in a, a textbook that I have, and it kind of identifies when each book of the Hebrew Bible was kind of cooked, whenever it was finalized, because there were some books that took really a short period of time to put together, relatively speaking. But then there are books like the Book of Ruth, which took a really long time to kind of come into its final form, according to most scholars. And when you think about what the Book of Ruth talks about, um, it kind of makes sense that that would have a little bit more of a, an open-ended um, time frame, because the Book of Ruth is the key to Jesus' connection to King David, correct? That's without uh, you know Boaz and, and, and Ruth and Naomi, that, that connection to King David wouldn't have happened, and that is in, in, integral to our understanding of who Jesus is. So that book has a little bit more of an open-ended. It took about, uh, I think if I remember correctly, about 600 years for that book to kind of open up and then to be finalized. So um, the interesting thing, though, is that not all the books of the Bible were suddenly like, you know, we have that testimony, we have that acceptance, we have that written tradition. Not all the books were, were as accepted as we might want to think. It wasn't that every person who was a believer believed in the same books. Some of the books of the Bible floated into acceptance, and then some of the books floated out of acceptance. Some, some of the books that, uh, that were considered, we have books like First and Second Clement. Um, those are letters from Pope Clement that are considered uh, by some very spiritual, very much, uh, should be very much a part of the, the canon that we read, but it didn't make the canon. We also have books like the Epistle of Barnabas. Um, if you read that one, it's not very friendly to the Jewish people. Um, it's widely considered a very anti-Semitic text, um, but it made its way into some canons and kind of floated out of acceptance. We also have, um, so we, we all know that we have um, the, the book of Revelation, um, or the Apocalypse of John, as it's sometimes called. Um, that book floated, was floating in and out of canon. Some people accepted it, some people didn't. Now we all know, spoiler alert, it made it into the canon. We talked about it last week. But for a long time, it didn't, and it wasn't. We also have the Gospels. Have you ever thought about why do we need four Gospels? Like, why are there four Gospels? Why are we reading the same story four different times? Have you considered that for a moment? Think about that. Why do we read four different Gospels? Three of which are all almost identical. That's why they're referred to as the synoptic Gospels. They are all basically telling the same story three different times. There's a couple of different parables involved. There's a couple of different stories. There's a sermon on a plane instead of a sermon on a mount. But in, in large part, why do we have four Gospels? And, that, and there was a guy who asked that question a long time ago. His name was Tatian. Um, and he was like, why do we need four Gospels? And so he wrote this uh, this kind of, what he did is he took all the Gospels and kind of mushed them together like a big lump of Play-Doh and turned them into this book called the Diatessaron, which is all four Gospels put into one Gospel. Because he was like, we don't need four Gospels. We only need one good one piece of good news. We don't need four pieces of good news. So it is really an interesting idea. Like, how did we get this, this book? And then, you know, we've got the Synoptic Gospels versus John's Gospel, which, let's just be honest, when you read the Gospel of John, that's a special little butterfly. We all know we all like Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but then John comes along, and he, as we talked about, he's that special little butterfly who, who sees things a little differently. Um, and so, 
Then we had some people come along and we were like, well, this canon kind of makes sense, but then we got some pieces that are a little, mm, don't, we don't know what to do with them. And so then some people started uh, kind of saying, this is important, but is it canon? It, it's important that we know these things, but it's not necessarily needs to be carried around in your Bible to church every single day. And that kind of formed an early version of what some of you might uh, be familiar with, is the Apocrypha. The books that weren't included in the, the Protestant Bible, but that the Roman Catholics and the Orthodox Church, in some cases, they have them in their Bibles. So we have 66 books in our Bible. If you pick up your Bible, you can probably count to 66 really easily. However, the Roman Catholic Bible that your Roman Catholic brothers and sisters um, read, they have several more books than we do. They have an entire section in the middle um, that is referred to as the Apocrypha, sometimes the intertestamental books. It, 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 they kind of take the, the place in time between the end of the Hebrew Bible and the beginning of the New Testament, that kind of, that big historical gap that nobody really pays much attention to in most Protestant churches, um, it kind of covers that period of time. It doesn't deal a lot with, with Jesus, and it doesn't deal a lot with the, the stories that connect Jesus to the Hebrew Bible, so some people just said, let's put it in the Apocrypha. So that's kind of what it happened, and that gives us an idea of how complicated this this Bible forming thing was. Then we get we can get into the the kind of the strands of the actual Bible itself, the Bible as a relic. What kind of Bibles were there? And I kind of started on number five on your little outline, going through some of the high points of what the Bible looks like. Where like how are all of these things evolving? So number five, we start with the Hebrew Bible. On um, the original Hebrew Bible. Um, had 27 books, still I believe it, uh, uh, some of them were one book, but we've divided, since divided them into two parts, so if you think about First and Second Kings, well, it was just called Kings, it really wasn't called anything, but it was just Kings, and then we have since divided it into two parts. I believe that Samuel falls into that category. Um, Chronicles is a little bit of a special book in the Bible. Um, most Hebrew scholars will not look very favorably on Chronicles because it messes up a whole bunch of stuff. And it was uh, written way after First and Second Kings. And it's basically all the First and Second Kings, but it's just bad. It's just got everything wrong. Or a lot of stuff wrong. So most Hebrew scholars don't really look at First and Second Chronicles as anything that uh, it just recapitulates First and Second Kings. But it was approximately 500 BCE that it kind of gelled and formed into what we know as it as today. And its primary language is Hebrew. There are some scriptures that were translated from Aramaic, but it's a, it's a small amount. Then we get to, we kind of jump forward in time, and we get to this thing called the Septuagint. The Septuagint is the, the Bible translated into Greek. Now, some of us think that... Um, it's a very common misconception to, to think that when we're reading the Bible and we're reading about these, these people called the Israelites or the Hebrews, that their Bible was always written in Hebrew, and then that's all they read. The interesting thing is that when the Roman Empire came in and sweep, swept up uh, Judea and Israel and all of ancient Palestine into their kingdom, the language that was the dominant language obviously became Greek. Everybody started speaking Greek. So guess what happened to the Hebrew Bible? It got translated into Greek so more people could read it. Because a lot of Jews became part of the diaspora, the, the Jews that were spread out all over this area. So instead of the Jews and the early Christians just being in this area, they became all part of this diaspora outside of the Jerusalem area. And so they had to have a Bible too, right? And some of them had kids in the diaspora. And, and what language would Jewish kids be speaking in the diaspora? They wouldn't be speaking Hebrew. They would probably have their first language being Greek. So there was a need for the Hebrew texts to be translated into the language that everybody used, and that was Greek. And that's where we get the Septuagint. Um, it had 53 books. It was kind of uh, fluid until around 200 BCE. Primarily, the language was Greek. Now, this is an interesting part. For a very long time, every Bible that you picked up, until I believe, if my memory serves, around the 1960s, was based on this next compilation, this next codex. It was based on the Masoretic text. 
The MT, if you ever pick up any um, like scholarly books or anything like that, you'll see the Masoretic text kind of thrown around left and right, MT. And that was the most authoritative version of the Bible for a very, very long time. But look at when it was written. 1008 CE. So 1008, that's, that's a really long time after Jesus' life, isn't it? If Jesus was, was crucified somewhere between 30 and 35 CE, this is a thousand years later that the Masoretic text was kind of found and landed on and written and all that stuff. So that means that there's a thought for a very long time, everyone believed that the Masoretic text was the most authoritative book. And so if you pick up a Bible that was uh, published pre like 1970, all of, the, all of the, the text will have been translated from this Masoretic text. And the interesting thing is, is especially if you get a study Bible, you're gonna notice that the study Bible portion at the bottom of the page takes up a huge amount of the text because so much so many notes had to be added to those books because we didn't know if this, uh, it's a thousand years. Imagine that you played a game of telephone that was a thousand years long. How different would that message from a thousand years ago be then than a thousand years later? So a lot of scholars were, were thinking, we have this thing called language drift and book drift and you know these scribes and these copiers, they're gonna be making mistakes and they're gonna be editing and changing things. So. The scholars were like building into their thoughts a lot of opportunities for things to have gone sideways. The interesting thing is, once we discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls, once we discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls from uh, Qumran, this little cave or series of caves where there were some, some jars that had some scrolls in it that were super well preserved, um, once we discovered that and we started to look and compare, we realized that the that thousand years, there wasn't nearly as much book drift as we thought there was. That a lot of the Masoretic texts matched what we were seeing, we as a, as a I'm a part of this, um, what scholars were looking at as part of the, the Dead Sea Scrolls. There was a lot of per perfect, perfect copy. It wasn't as nearly as much book drift. So if you look at a study Bible today, you'll notice that the study Bible section at the bottom that tells you notes and things at the bottom is much smaller than the books that were published you know, a little under 100 years ago. Those study Bibles have a much bigger part because we've since learned that by looking at those texts that are closer to the original writings, that there wasn't nearly as much difference as we thought that there might have been. And the Dead Sea Scrolls basically include everything that we see in the Hebrew Bible today, except for maybe one book. And I, and I wish I could tell you which book that was, but I didn't have the presence of mind to write that down. But the Dead Sea Scrolls, pretty, I think, it, now that I think about it, it might have been Ruth. I could be wrong Ruth about that. Esther. It's Ruth or Esther. It's one, of the, it's one of those really interesting ones. It's important, but it had a lot to do with the, I, I want to say it was Ruth. Anywho, it was written on vellum. Most of you know what vellum is. It's like a, a skin. It's um, kind of... Um, durable, but it, it's not meant to be archival, so we're very lucky to have uh, that still around. Um, and it fills a lot of gaps because this community in Qumran was kind of isolated, and so they weren't as affected by the, the Greeks and the Romans coming in and affecting culture. They kind of were very insular in, in that, and they kept the Hebrew culture very, very tightly knit because they had a very kind of fundamentalist view of the world at that time. So. It's very interesting to see that. And then we get into some of the, the Christian influences. There are several um, codexes. A uh, codex is just a, a big book of, of vellum, and uh, um, it's put together, and it's very expensive. But there are several codexes, codices, that existed that we look at, and I'll just mention a couple of them. We had uh, the Codex Vaticanus. It had 76 books. Now remember, our Protestant book today has 66 books. So the Codex Vaticanus had 76 books. It was finalized in about 350, and it was written in Greek. Then we had the Codex Sinaiticus. It had 82 books, and around 300 to 400 CE is when it was written, and it was written in Greek. You have the Codex Alexandrinus. It had 82 books, written in 400 to 500 CE, written in Greek. Um, then we have the Vulgate. Now this is when all of the Bible got translated into the, the language of academia. And the language of academia was Latin. 
And so that's where the Vulgate comes in. You'll sometimes see it uh, um, abbreviated, um, but most of the time, um, I, I always have seen it written out. It had 80 books, uh, 390 CE, it was written in Latin. Then we had uh, some start, some translations starting to come in. So we had the, the, the Wycliffe Bible, it had 80 books. It was written in 1384 CE. Some of you are very familiar with this book. Remember Johann Gutenberg? He's the guy who uh, came up with the printing press. The Gutenberg Bible, of which there are still a couple surviving, um, had 80 books. It was written. In, it was printed in 1455 CE in Latin. You have the Luther Bible. Um, guess who that was at? Who, who championed that? Martin Luther, the the guy who uh, championed the uh, the uh, the big the big schism or the second big schism. Um, 80 books. It was written in 1522 in German. Um, you have the Coverdale Bible. It had 80, 80 books. It was written in English, um, air quotes in English because it was a very old English. The Geneva Bible was written in English. It had 80 books. The Bishop's Bible, it had 80, uh, 80 books. Um, then we get into some American Bibles. We have the, uh, the Atkin King James Bible. You notice how it suddenly drops off. We've seen 80 books, 80 books, 81 books, 82 books, 77 books. How many books does the King James Bible have? 66 books. Sounds awful familiar, doesn't it? So why, why does an, the first American Bible suddenly have only 66 books? Well, the answer is nobody really knows, but there's a, uh, the, the kind of the, the wives' tale or the story that goes along with it is that during the American Revolution, we have to remember that America wasn't just in revolution against England. This also was a de facto war that involved the Church of England as well. Who supplied all the Bibles to the American colonies? England. England. What happens when you don't have books being supplied by England? You've got to start printing your own. And what happens when you're a colony that doesn't have a great printing press and, a, and all the, the, the things that you need? You have a paper shortage. And what happens when you have a paper shortage? You have to decide what's important and what's not. And so that's kind of the story. Uh, whether it's true or not is anybody's guess. Um, nobody, I, I've never heard anybody in, in school actually uh, cite that as actually happening. People will just say, I don't know. But I think it's a funny story. It makes a lot of sense to me. So I'm going to share it with you today. Um, so that's, that's uh, one of the reasons by which uh, it's believed that we ended up with 66 books instead of 88 books, which is what the, uh, the Anglican Church still has to this day. Um, then you have the Collins King James. Um, an interesting thing about the King James. The King James Bible is, uh, so one of, the, one of the things about books um, is that they are owned by publishers, correct? We all know that. So if you wanted to go um, pick up uh, Oprah Winfrey's most recent book, whatever that book is, I, I don't, I have no idea. But if you wanted to pick it up and you wanted to go print it and send it out to all of your friends, what would Oprah Winfrey do? She would sue the pants off of you. Why? Because her and the publisher own the rights to that book. Well, I have a version of the, um, the Bible right here. It's the English Standard Version. If I printed this, if I just went downstairs and started printing copies of it, guess what would happen to me? I would get the pants sued off of me because someone owns the English Standard Version translation. It is owned by a publisher. So is the New Revised Standard Version. So is the Common English Bible. Most modern translations, the, the New uh, International Version, all of them are owned by someone, except the King James. The King James is one of the only Bibles that's an open source. It's open to anybody. Anybody can publish it for free. Nobody owns that translation. So that's why you see King James versions being just printed left and right by everybody. The interesting thing, though, is, is that there's, if it's an authentic King James Version, there, there, um, there are some things that, and features of it that you will, you will notice that make it a King James Version. For instance, um, you'll not see an S at the end of the word. So if you see the word Genesis, we spell it. So if you see this word in an authentic King James Bible, it will not look like that. It will look like... 
because there was a terminal S that was used and then a middle S that was used that looked more like an F. So if you see two S's in the word Genesis, it's not an actual King James. It's been modified in some way. An authentic King James Bible that is true to the original will not have this middle S. It will only have the terminal S, which is a little interesting tidbit if you're ever in the book buying business. So let's talk a little bit about um, that misconception about the, the, Ni the Council of Nicaea. So the Council of Nicaea had some very specific things that it needed to get done as it related to the business of the church. The, the first thing, they needed to talk about uniformity of belief. They wanted to make sure that everything in Christendom was kind of lining up, and that if you became a Christian, that, that you were being taught to believe the right things. And some of you might have heard of something called the Nicene Creed. The Nicene Creed was a very contentious, very contentious creedal statement that uh, got, got uh, codified in this uh, Nicene, uh, Council of Nicaea to help uniformly define what Christians should and should not believe. Um, the second thing is it was, it was to address a specific heresy. There was a heresy running around uh, in the world of Christendom where um, some, some people, um, in fact some very influential people, uh, a guy named Arius, he perpetuated the idea that Jesus was begotten. He was part of the creation. He was not with God at the beginning. He was not in, in all ways and for all time um, kind of being. And if Jesus was begotten as part of creation, that means Jesus is subordinate to God. Because anything in creation is subordinate to the creator. And so that was called the Arian heresy. This guy named Arius came up with that idea and started spreading it. And it became, it, it was, it was kind of popular. And so the church had to get together and decide what is it going to do to deal with this big heresy. And the Council of Nicaea was convened in part to address this big problematic heresy that was uh, following, uh, kind of uh, flowing around. It also enshrined Easter as part of the ecumenical calendar. So if you like having a day off for Easter, you can thank the Council of Nicaea for that, because they are the ones who, uh, who put it together. They also addressed canon law. Now this is where most of the misconception about how the Bible formed being part of the Council of Nicaea happened. Canon law is not deciding what's in the Bible. Canon law is like the Supreme Court jurisprudence. We all have these court cases, correct, that we know. We have Plessy versus Ferguson, the, the ugly one that said that uh, you know African Americans are not equal, they are separate, um, and we have to give them separate water fountains. As long as that water fountain is equal, it's perfectly okay. That, that's Plessy versus Ferguson. Um, and then you have uh, the Dred Scott decision, that really horrible one that uh, decided that African Americans are only um, part um, but, uh, no, that's the one that uh, that decided that. Okay, now I'm now I'm losing everything. Yeah, the slave is born to a free state, he's still a slave. Yes, that's the one. That really ugly one. Um, <laughs> yes, yes, those fun things, those really ugly things. But then we have things like the Loving decision, which said that interracial marriage is okay. And um, so then you have uh, all of these things. That's basically the secular version of canon law. The church also has canon law. They had court cases and spiritual cases brought before them. That's what the Nicene Council was really talking about, is canon law. They weren't talking about biblical canon. The Council of Nicaea had nothing to do with biblical canon. In fact, um, it was a guy, um, the, the first mention that we really have of a biblical canon that looks like us goes all the way back to 367. 367 CE, uh, a bishop uh, wrote a letter. Um, I think I have his name in your notes. Um, let me see if I did. If I did that, I include that. Athanasius, yes, that fellow, Athanasius. He wrote a letter. Um, it was his uh, 39th uh, letter, and it was written to celebrate Easter. And he included a whole bunch of books that he thinks that churches should have. And he also included some books that he didn't think that churches should have. Um, but he believed that were important. And it, um, so let's see here. 
This is what he said. In the, uh, in the 39th festival letter, also known as the uh, Easter letter, he identified books in the Bible very similar to what we read today. Um, he included books like Tobit, which we won't see in our Protestant Bibles, Judith and Esther. Um, he didn't include some of them, and but he said that these books that he didn't include were appointed by the fathers to be read by those who newly join us and who wish for instructions in the word of godliness. So that sounds an awful lot like canon, doesn't it? So basically he's saying these books don't need to be part of the Bible, but they still need to be part of your spiritual growth and edification. And so that's, that's the first time in history that we start seeing what looks like a, a Bible canon. And so by the time that the Council of Nicaea formed, the, the Council of Nicaea happened in 325, this letter from Athanasius came in 367. So that means that for, for Athanasius to have written this in that time frame, that these books had to have been circulating extremely widely and being accepted extremely widely among the Christians of that day for him to have written about it in 367. It would not have given the Council of Nicaea enough time from 325 to 367 for Athanasius to have written, these are the accepted books of the Bible and these are or not. That just isn't enough time in an ancient world for that sort of thing to happen. Accepting canon was a much broader and a much more fluid process than I think any modern Christians would really feel comfortable with. <laughs> Most of us like to think that a church said, homina, 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 omni, 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 this is the Bible. I think that that's what we want to believe. That makes us feel kind of cozy in our, in our homes. But the truth is much messier than that. It was a very fluid concept. It wasn't like that. It was messy. It was not linear. But it ended up with us having a very important book that we all look to today as authoritative. So that's a little bit about uh, where the Bible came from. Um, obviously, um, if you ever decide to go to seminary, you will learn a lot more of this in much greater detail. But um, that's a little bit of an overview. Um, as always, I will be hanging around uh, afterwards if you have any questions, comments, concerns. Um, next week, we're going to be talking, um, as I mentioned, we're going to be starting talking about the Bible in context in the Hebrew Bible. and. Rather than dive in with Genesis, I'm going to start by talking an overview of the first five books of the Bible, what's called the Torah. And we're going to talk a little bit about that before we dive into each one of the books of the Torah um, in, in, in its context. So I want to give you a big, broad picture, and then we'll start narrowing down in the Torah. From there. So um, thank you guys so much for listening today. Um, I hope it wasn't uh, too boring going back over some things that we've already talked about, but I hope that it reminded you of some things that uh, maybe, if you're like me, you forget when you go to sleep at night. So, I will turn it back over to the, our illustrious leader, Jeannie Cochran.